followers of Muhammad is telling humanity that there is only one Quran. That Quran has been perfectly preserved to the dot, to the letter, to the sound, and to the word. Wherever you go around the world, there is only one perfect Quran. And they have to kind of put together, okay, there is only one Quran which has been perfectly preserved, but today there are different Arabic Qurans are circulating around. And at the time of Muhammad, there were different Arabic Qurans. And the magic word is Ahruf. Now, we have to put together how can while how can there will be different Arabic Qurans at the time of Muhammad? We don't even what it we don't even know what it means. And today, how can there be more than one Quran? Yet we have to still believe there is only one Quran. Hmm. There are holes in the narrative. It all lose and people do their best. There are big gaps and people try to fill the gaps. And it is there is limited evidence. It is guest work. But the miracle word is Ahruf to figure all these things out. According to the Islamic tradition, Quran was revealed to Muhammad in seven different Ahruf. And while everything messed up and many Qurans circulating around, now Muslims need to figure out what Ahruf means. Sheikh Yasir Qadi expressed in his book Science of the Quran, Allah knows best regarding the word Ahruf. And Muslim missionaries are not only running away, but also intentionally lying regarding the definition of the Ahruf. And it seems to me now, even they were not justified with their own lie for themselves, what Ahruf means. Professor Yasin Dutton, um, approximately 2018 in a conference where he talks about the preservation of the Quran. He mentions what is this Ahruf and some Muslim missionaries are simply questioning what Ahruf is and how can we put all these thing, all these different Qurans and different ways of the Qurans together and still publicly say that Quran has been perfectly preserved. Let's hear Professor Yasin Dutton, as well as some of the Muslim missionaries, to know this magic word, Ahruf, which caused concern between followers of Muhammad, and it is still causing concern in Muslim world. From Omar ibn Khattab, who said, I heard Hisham ibn Hizam reciting Surah al-Furqan differently to the way I recited it. And it was the Prophet وسلم, who had taught me it. So Umar ibn Khattab is in a situation where he hears <coughs> this other man reciting a surah that he knows, or he thinks he knows. And, but it's different. So he, he's a little bit surprised. I was about to rush up to him. This is Sidna Umar and his, you know, jid. I was about to rush up to him, but I allowed him time to finish his prayer because he's doing the prayer. I mean, he's a poor guy. He's just sitting, you know, standing there reciting Quran, and Omar is wanting to grab hold of him. So, but then he did. Oh, when he's finished the prayer, he says, then I grabbed hold of him, grabbed him by his cloak, and took him to the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and said, Messenger of Allah, I heard this man reciting Surah Al-Furqan, Surah Al-Furqan, differently to the way you taught me it. So I've just heard him, he's reciting the, that same surah. I learnt it from you, and it's different from the way I learnt it. There's a question mark in his mind. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, let him go. If, <laughs> I forget what the Arabic is, mahlan or something, I don't know. Then he said, recite Hisham. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying to Hisham, you recite. And Hisham recited it in the same way that he'd done so before. In other words, the way he'd learnt was the way that he then repeated the recitation when the Prophet asked him to recite. And Hisham recited it the same way. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, yes, it was sent down like that. Unzil. 
or Haga the Nazar. Again, I can't forget the Arabic. Then he told me to recite. So he's talking to Sidna Omar. And Sidna Omar did so. I did so, he said. And he said, it was sent down like that. Yes. This Quran was sent down in seven different versions. Ala sab'ati ahruf. That's the phrase in the hadith. Ala sab'ati ahruf. Now, ala is clear. Ala means on or according to or something like that. Sab'a is clear. We had kitab as sab'a. We've got sab'a. Wa'at, neen, tlata, arba, khamsa, sit, sab'a. Seven. It's a well-known Arabic word. Ahruf. Mm. Not so easy. It's the plural of the word harf. Actually, it has different plurals. Ahruf is what they call a plural of paucity. General qilla. If you're one to less than ten, or ten up to ten, you can use this. And then if you want to talk about many, as in another hadith, it says huruf, huruf kathira, many huruf. So you have possibility of huruf, possibility of harf. What does harf mean? Harf is an interesting one. Originally, it's the edge of a sword. Hafa. The edge of something. The hem. But what does it mean here? Ala sab'ati a'ruf. On seven edges. The literal translation that you could possibly work with. Seven edges. What do seven edges mean? I've attempted in my article to, uh, to uh, maybe I should start looking at the article because I've, I've gone through these things bit by bit. It has the idea, I, I always think of geodesic domes or something, and you know, you've got sort of like different edges making up one thing because they're all edges of the same thing. That's the key thing. It's like a seven edged, and even seven is, we'll see later that. Seven is, doesn't mean literally, well, some people say it does mean literally seven. Other people say no, seven is when the Arabs want to refer to uh, multiplicity, but a, a small level. And 70 is if you want to refer to multiplicity at a larger level. Or even arba'in, you could say like 40 or 70. And then 700, as in the hadith, you know, the reward of the point of fasting is, you know, you know 700 uh, times that, etc. Meaning many, many times. So I've always understood seven as being best understood in that way here. So it means seven means a small amount, but nevertheless more than one. So there's a sort of multiplicity. And then the end of the Prophet said, this Quran was sent down, unzila al Quran or ala sabati ahruf, according to seven hafs. So recite whatever it is easy for you. Fakra'u ma tayassara min. Fakra'u ma tayassara min. What is easy? Yasir is easy. Ma tayassara, what is easy? So that is another part of the picture because what we're in a sense looking at, these are the texts. Nobody else says anything else. Among the Muslims, these, this is the key text. Nobody has anything else. That's why Ibn al-Jazari, the beginning of his book, spends something like 50 pages discussing this particular hadith and the meanings behind this particular hadith. Because that is it. That is the evidence that we have. So recite of it what is easy for you. What does that mean? As they, have I heard in South Africa, use the expression, park that. Meaning, just like, leave that thought on the side for a while. So. Umar concerns that there are different versions of the Quran. Professors can't even make a decision what is this word seven means. The key text is not that clear. Our roof, not so easy. What we do is we park it on side that is the key text and it is not even clear let's park it to understand and would love to know your thoughts on how do you conceptualize um the activity of you know uh recitation the quranic activity prior to the incident of the ahl um and also i mean i don't know if there is I, I don't, uh, not to my knowledge anyway, um, the incident of the Ahruf didn't really take place on the um, request of the Muslim community as, as a complaint mm. from the Muslim community, um, because we know the seven Ahruf were, were part of the Ruchas. 
And so how do you kind of conceptualise what happened prior to the incident of the Ahrof? How were the companions mm. dealing with recitation? Because we know it was, obviously, since the time of revelation, it was a continuing process. That is a big gap. Yes, that's correct. There is a big gap. Those different Arabic Qurans apparently give birth from second century. And individual starts to talking about or officializing those things 300 years after Muhammad. That is big gap. But how do we reconcile those different Arabic Qurans? What was it? How was it before and after this hadith? Answer is, we don't know. It is all magic. It is all magic. And I thought, well, what's going on? This one's trying to present it sort of vaguely historically. That came to my mind. So I thought, right, okay, what evidence have we got from the time of the Prophet? And I thought, well, that hadith is the obvious one. That is obviously dated at the time of the Prophet and gives us some indication of what was going on at his time. But that's it. We don't know if it was like that the week before, the week after, the year before, the year after. When was the year even? We don't know that. So there's a huge amount we don't know. But all we can say is that was at the time of the Prophet Now Ibn Mujahid, he's who I started with. Ibn Mujahid is already 300 years later. Automatically, he's way after, you know. And, and all of those readers that we've been looking at, like Nerfia and Asim, etc., they're all sort of died 110, died 120 died 150, died. That's second century. So that, again, is years after the prophetic event. So there's, it's, if you like, there's, there's the initial uh, phenomenon of the revelation, some memories that we've got in Hadith, and then basically what you might call a big gap. That's how the critics would look at it, probably. A big gap, because they then almost like jumps a generation. So the generation of the companions, they've now passed away and it's the people after them, the successors, and the successors of the successors that are carrying this on as best they can. And so it's like fiqh as well. It's like, uh, it's like all these disputes about hadith and so on. So it's like trying to fill in that gap. That first hundred years is basically undocumented except for a few exceptions, important exceptions, incidentally. Like, for example, if you have coins which say, Qulhu Allahu Ahad, then at least one ayah out of, you know, 500 and 5,000 and whatever it is ayahs, you can say, yes, I've got documentary evidence, I've got a dated coin which says, Qulhu Allahu Ahad, or something like that. But how, how about the rest of the Quran? <laughs> That's what people say, you see. And you've got Malik quoting from the Quran, but he's only quoting little bits. So then people criticize, me, for example, and they say, oh yeah, but that's only, how can you say that's all the Quran? I can't say it's all the Quran, I'm not saying that. So I'm saying that the evidence is very limited and we've got a bit here and then a big gap and then a bit here and then a bit of a gap and then by the time you get to Ibn Mujahid, you've got solid evidence and you've got Fatabayyinu, Fatathebatu written down in a manuscript with other copies of that manuscript and references to that book and you get all this sort of cross-reference. But Ibn Mujahid wrote a book on the Shawath, which we don't have. We have reference to it, but we don't actually have the book. So what was that? His student, Ibn Khalaway, did write a book on the Shawath, and that's actually quite useful. But it's, do you see what I'm getting at? It's like, even in the more recent times, it's, it's almost like a guesswork that, that one's got anything. So it's very, very difficult. But the, uh, it gets very complicated, so one does the best one can. It is very complicated. It is all guesswork. There are disputes and gaps, and all we can do is try to do our best to fill the gaps. But we know the timeline is very much farther and long. 300 years over 100 years with the limited evidence what we do is we do guesswork it's a it's like a taking daisy loves me not love me love me not love me love me not love me 
you play those things with the daisies. And now we do the same thing with the Quran and with the different Arabic Qurans. How do we reconcile it? We just play this guessing game. The very question of the, the concept of Ahraf, the Prophet did not explain it, obviously, for an obvious reason. And one of the reasons, you know, what I understand is because the Arabic grammar wasn't systematized then, different, the Kabila and the Kabail that were there within the Arabian Peninsula, they had their own linguistic nuances within their tradition. So every Kabila had their own linguistic nuance. So whether they prefer something to use in their expression, a singular word for to express something, the plural form of that word, it's particularly specific to that particular group of people. So in the absence of systematic presentation in books, forms that people know of, like, oh, this is Ikhfa, and this is Ilhar, and this is this drama, and this is Nasr, and this is Rafa. Without this kind of language, is this why the Prophet Islam left vague and actually allowed this Ruhsa of people reciting, which is easier for them, because obviously some people might find it difficult to recite it in a plural form or singular form, or in this grammatical forms of uh, Mansur, and Marfu, and Majur. This is what we find in, in our uh, there are differences. Is this what, what you think um, could be a reason why it was something to explain? Because it's quite obvious, um, it's not something that you can explain it then, but he just allowed the communities to recite it as it was easier for them. Prophet didn't explain what is this Ahruf and what are those differences. But now Muslim missionaries can guess why he didn't explain. Because they know much better than their Prophet. They are very good communicator. They can explain why Muhammad failed to explain. Word. The trouble is that we, again, we are so much later on historically that it's hard to know what it probably meant at that time. And so we have to do the long way around of, you know, going by dictionaries and other tafsirs, you know, women. Women, women and nursing and yeah, but Allah had a harf in and trying to think, hmm, how, how might that fit? And so you do the best you can with the information that you've got and the evidence that you've got, but you still come up at the end with something that's rather difficult to understand. And if you've got to come at some kind of sense of what it probably means, and then you say, ah, oh, yeah, well, that fits that meaning of the word, so let's just go with that for a while. If it means that, okay. So, I mean, I'm skirting around again, but that's. Uh, that's how I tend to look at it. Sorry, I'll come to, I'll come to you. I'll come to you. The Rumsa was given to read in different ways. Mm. They, looking at the hadith which are in uh, Sahih collections, mm. which seems to indicate that the Prophet directly taught them the particular surah. So they heard from the Prophet and when they replied, but after like the example of Amr al Khattab, Amr al Mashad, King, or the one, it seems to indicate that you know, they, they learned it directly from the Prophet. So obviously direct learning would be when the Prophet recited to that particular mm -hmm. companion and he's learned it that way. Rather than you know, there's a stock template where you can actually use that template with the degree of variances that are allowed and permissible. <coughs> you know, that's the other question I would like to clarify. So the question is, obviously the Prophet Islam would not have taught every single companion um, all the different ways of reading. It's mm. practically mm. Yeah, impossible. It's impossible. Yeah. So that means there has to be a way where the companions had their own ikhtiyar, uh, their choice, mm. uh, based on the permissibility uh, that was given. So they, they have clear understanding of how much, or what was the degree of variations, or variations that you can uh, bring about in, in revelation. Um, the question remains is, you know, what was exactly the ruqsa that was given? I mean, some of the hadith which indicates no, Rahim, but um, I'm not sure about the authenticity of some of these um, mm. narrations. So if we go for strict authentic narrations, then you have one picture, but if you have the evidence speaks for itself, then you can get a different picture altogether. Um, what's your clarification on this? Um, when the same two people from the same dialect or mm. um, tribe oh, are yeah. reciting differently, if the Prophet taught them differently, and how is it making it easier? 
to give an example, let's talk for Thunder examples where, where they are um, single and um, jammer. Mm. Where a word is recited in singular and plural. Mm. Um, e examples of where it's a yam, alun, and tam, or something of this in yeah. terms of um, grammatical declension. How is it making it easier for a two adult companion, rather than, say, someone who's very old and how, especially women who are not very literate, or, or children? Because for that, we can have an understanding of, okay, there are some difficulty for them, for example, you know, you very old or you know, literate as well. But two persons who are actually, you know, very adult, mature person, who are learning directly from the prophet, how are these making it easier for them to recite? I mean, what, what's the difference in terms of choosing um, variations? Good question. We've been asking the same questions to this Muslim missionary for a couple of years now. How can it make it easier if the people are from the same tribe? Hmm. He indicates this is what Muhammad meant. My guessing game. Like a daisy. Love me or love me not. Love me, love me not. We have to figure out what we do is we play the guessing game. How do we, how can it be easier? Two people from the same tribe is simply asking the learning the same way learning the different ways how can that be easier i've got one one immediate possible response and another one the immediate possible response is that you're trying to remember something and was it they or he can't remember was it they or we doesn't matter, say whatever, as long as the meaning is there. So one kind of ease is that as long as you get the general idea right, you're okay. Now the other thing is that you were talking about the way the Prophet taught me. Do we know the way the Prophet actually, well, again, there's riwayat that do give us an indication like we, he taught us this pro, poem, sorry, he taught us this dua like he would teach us a surah of the Quran, for example. So we understand that there were words that were taught in a, a certain form, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, and it always has to be one, two, three, four, five. But I wonder whether it was a one-ish, followed by a two-ish, followed by a three-ish, followed by a four-ish, followed by a five-ish, because we don't actually know. As long as you've got one, two, three, four, five in that kind of order, again, it's back to the idea of what was it when we say the way the Prophet Sallallahu recited, what do we actually mean? Because we're thinking in terms, we're expecting, and people have expected for, you know, literally 1400 years or whatever it is, they've, they've been expecting a very limited understanding of the way the Prophet Sallallahu recited it which is why there's a problem in the first place. Because that Sayyidina Omar says, look, and it, that's the wording, isn't it? So that hadith is such a critical thing because to understand that is to basically understand everything. Because he was told, yes, that was the way it was revealed. Now, what does that mean? It was revealed with exactly that sort of, you know, Pirish Zabra and all this kind of thing, or does it mean that, yes, that was the the meaning, that was the vicar, because the vicar is something that reminds you. Again, it's not a, well, I suppose the vicar, you could say it's, hey, do that, you know, rem remind yourself of that. I mean, there are lots of loose ends, you see. What does that mean? As they, if I heard in South Africa, use the expression, park that. Meaning, just like, leave that thought on the side for a while. So, there are big gaps, there are disputes and more gaps, and those gaps need to be filled. How do we know the way Muhammad taught answer is? We don't know. We will never know. If we knew, we wouldn't have the problem at the first place. We wouldn't have the different Arabic Qurans. What we would do, we do our best. We do our best. Prophet didn't explain things. Allah didn't explain things. But essentials we know is there are holes in the narrative. There are big gaps. And those gaps need to be filled. We do our best to try to fill those gaps with the very much limited 
evidence. Heartbreaking to say, but I don't think the Quran is going to fix that. I don't think Quranic manuscripts are going to fix that. I don't think Islamic tradition is going to fix that. No one is being able to, no one is able to going to fix that there is only one Quran, even though many versions out there with the holes, all those kind of things. But it still help, helps us to see that Muslims are hungry for something. They are hungry for the perfect word of God. They are hungry the way to fill the holes. They are hungry to fill the gaps and fix the problems. It needs to be done because it is affecting their eternity. But it has already been fixed. Problem is already been fixed. And problem was not many different versions of the Quran or the word of Allah or corruption, the word of Allah. But the problem was the heart of human who is running away from God himself. And the eternal word of God, Lord Jesus Christ, fixed that problem by giving himself on the cross for us. He filled the gaps, gap between man and God. God came down and filled that gap through death and resurrection of his son. And that gap caused holes, holes in the word of God, holes in his hand, holes in his feet, yet still offered us place in the, his bosom and still stands out as the perfect eternal word of God. Problem to fixing the holes, problem to know what is the way problem with the limited evidence and gaps it is all been found in lord jesus christ eternal son of god eternal word of god